Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Dr. Stephen Roth and I'm a board certified oral and maxillofacial pathologist. Today, as a part of my clinical review series, we will be discussing a very important condition called pemphigus vulgaris. But first, we have to get into that disclaimer, which is that all opinions expressed in this video are mine and mine alone, and do not represent any organization that may employ me or that I may belong to, and that this video is for educational purposes only and should not serve as medical advice. Should you have any questions or concerns about your oral or systemic health, please see your nearest oral or systemic health care provider. And with that being said, let's get into today's video. Pemphigus vulgaris is a relatively rare autoimmune disease. In health, our body creates substances called antibodies that fight off invaders like bacteria and viruses. But in autoimmune diseases like pemphigus, our body creates antibodies that mistake our own cells as invaders and it starts destroying them. The target of the antibodies in pemphigus are called desmoglians, specifically desmoglians one and three. These molecules are really important in maintaining the structural integrity of our skin and mucous membranes by holding the epithelial cells together, kind of like Velcro. The way that I like to explain it to my patients is that the antibodies cover the Velcro between our cells, preventing them from sticking. This causes the skin and the mucous membranes to blister and fall apart, creating ulceration. You can imagine that this condition is extremely painful the entire mouth essentially becomes one big ulcer, which can make speaking, eating, and drinking nearly impossible. Patients can become malnourished and dehydrated pretty quickly, and it's not uncommon for patients to experience significant weight loss due to their inability to eat solid food. Pemphigus vulgaris can involve the oral cavity, as well as mucous membranes of the nasal cavity, conjunctiva of the eyelids, and anal and genital mucosa. It can also involve the skin. We say that the oral mucosal lesions are often the first to show and the last to go after a treatment is initiated. We diagnose pemphigus in a few ways. The first is a blood test called an ELISA test. This test looks for the antibodies that define this disease, DSG-1 and DSG-3, which are the desmoglein 1 and 3 autoantibodies that circulate throughout the blood. I like to have my patients get this blood test as we can also track disease control using these values. As the disease becomes more controlled, the values decrease and may even be undetectable. So it is very helpful in tracking this condition. We can also perform a traditional biopsy. This will show that the epithelium has fallen apart, a process that we like to call acantholysis. This leaves behind only the basal or lowest layer of epithelium. That's because this basal layer has a different molecule that keeps it attached while the rest of the epithelium falls apart. Additionally, we have a special type of biopsy called immunofluorescence. This allows us to see where the patient's antibodies are located within the tissue using a special microscope. To diagnose this condition, I often do all three of these tests, the blood test, the traditional biopsy, and the direct immunofluorescence. I do have to admit that biopsies in pemphigus patients can be quite difficult as their tissue is super fragile, almost like tissue paper. Fortunately, I did receive permission from a patient to film their biopsy, and I'll be releasing a video explaining how to best perform a biopsy to diagnose this condition in the near future. So be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. Once a patient receives a diagnosis, it is time to start treatment. It is important to start treatment as soon as possible. Pemphigus that is diagnosed early responds much better to treatment, though advanced cases can respond well too, it just may take a little bit longer. I start with very high doses of steroids, up to one milligram per kilogram. I oftentimes don't wait for confirmation, and if I'm highly suspicious, I start the steroids while waiting for results. It's important to perform the tests prior to starting steroids though, as steroid treatment may lead to false negatives on biopsy and blood tests. These high doses of steroids may lead to some side effects, including increased hunger, increased energy, and mood swings, as well as an increased risk of osteoporosis, weight gain, and hair growth. 
Long-term steroid use can lead to a syndrome called Cushing's disease, but oftentimes patients don't need to be on steroids for too, too long. It's also important that patients do not stop high-dose steroids once they start, but instead taper slowly by slowly reducing the dose over time. It is extremely dangerous to stop high-dose steroids cold turkey and can lead to a life-threatening adrenal crisis. Once a diagnosis is established, I refer the patients to a hematologist oncologist or a rheumatologist or a dermatologist to start a medication called rituximab. Whoever of these providers is closest to the patient and comfortable with this medication, that's where I refer them. Rituximab is a medication that targets a type of blood cell called a B cell. The B cell creates the antibodies that cause this condition. Patients may be scared when they Google this medication and see that it treats cancers like leukemia and lymphoma, but pemphigus is not a cancer. It just so happens that a cancer medication also treats this autoimmune disease. These specialists will do blood work to make sure it's safe to start this infusion medication, and patients that have undergone these infusions have responded extremely well. In my experience, Patients on rituximab experience anywhere between one and seven years of disease-free remission, which is a word that means the disease is quiet and not causing problems. It's important to continue to follow these patients though, as this chronic condition will reappear and patients often require what my mentor called tune-ups or an additional infusion or two every so often when they have flare-ups. Prompt diagnosis and treatment of pemphigus is critical. Before steroids were introduced as a medication, 75 to 90% of patients would die. But now, only about 5% of patients have serious morbidity or mortality with treatment. This condition is one of the most rewarding that I treat. Patients go from a severe, severe presentation that is life-threatening to fully healed with relatively high predictability. Because it is relatively rare though, this condition often goes under-recognized and under or misdiagnosed. I hope that this video will both raise awareness and educate on this important, painful, serious condition. Thanks for watching. I hope that you found this video informative. And if you did, please share it with someone else that you think will find it helpful as well. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future oral pathology content and give this video a like while you're at it. Thanks again for watching and be well.